Verily, uh, Sir Jonathan, could you please read this week's sponsorship? <laughs> Nothing would give me greater pleasure, Alex Meehan. This week's Dicebreaker podcast is sponsored by Gordian Quest. If you're a PC gamer who loves tabletop RPGs, you have to check this game out. Gordian Quest is an epic RPG influenced by old school classics like Dungeons and Dragons, Ultima and Wizardry, but embellished with modern gaming concepts such as deck building, turn-based tactical combat and strategic decision making. Form a party of heroes of different classes and lead them on a journey to unravel curses laid upon the lands. Forge bonds, discover new skills, and make them stronger with legendary weapons spawned from the spoils of battle. Gordian Quest boasts a 92% positive rating on Steam and is available now at a 10% discount for a limited time only. Hello and welcome to the Dice Breaker Podcast. This is episode 13, unlucky for some, or just sort of par for the course if you are a baker. Uh, my name is Johnny Chiodini, I'm head of video at Dicebreaker.com. I am delighted to be joined this week uh, by staff writer Alex Meehan. Hello. Hello. Video producer Alex Lolis. Hi. And for the very first time in Dicebreaker podcast history, we have a special guest, the one and only Dean Abdu. Hello, Dean. Hello. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been paying attention to the YouTube channel, firstly, shame. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, you may not know that Dean has just joined the cast of Dungeon Breaker, which is our ongoing D&D series, um, as Fareed. Uh, who basically I think everyone is Im immediately thirsty for. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, oh, wow. Could you tell us a bit about Fareed, just for anyone who, who doesn't, who, who isn't already familiar? <laughs> yeah, so Fareed uh, is a lovable wood elf who is a uh, person of colour. I did this because I really, really wanted to, you know, get some representation in there. Plus, I also remembered how much uh, the racists hate hated that the witcher series got elves that were people of color so i was like you know what let's just let's just burn them even more <laughs> uh and here's fareed um he's he's like got a lovely feather color which i also own irl uh which i owned before the D, &D series it wasn't specifically for that series i i just liked the feather color <laughs> um and uh he's he's Unlike me, he's six foot. I'm five foot four IRL. I'm very sorry, uh, but I like being <laughs> tiny, so it's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the 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 thing about his name, Fareed, is that like I wanted to dedicate the character to my late uncle who passed away in 2015. Uh, he just really supported me in like this endeavor to go into the media industry. Like I come from a family of scientists and doctors and whatnot. Uh, so it was a it was a bit of a change that one of the people in this massive massive family wanted to not do science or medicine or anything and wanted to make silly videos on the internet, <laughs> and here I am. It's worked out I well, can... and he supported me through it. Yeah, I consider your amazing brand of entertainment, you know, as a form of medicine. <laughs> it, well... it cures what ails you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Maybe I can now tell tell the family. Technically, I am in medicine. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> send them right that here. Um, send them that recording. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, the thing is, you look at Fareed and you think about this like amazing backstory, which is really, really lovely. And then you sort of the camera pans over to the rest of the Dungeon Breaker crew, and it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> we've got a mouthy Kenku who's addicted to horrible potions. Um, we've got a Tabaxi that tries their best not to eat him uh, and of course our lord and saviour tim the goblin is sort of just poking around <laughs> being wowed by everything so um yeah uh dungeon breaker it's a hoot you should check it out um where can people find you when they can't find well i was going to say when they can't find you on this podcast or on dungeon breaker you know what i mean where else can you be found <laughs> on the internet dean abdu I could be found in so many places, you know, you can find me on all the Gamer Network sites, just popping up randomly, but personally, I'm on Twitter, which is at the Dean Abdu, and I'm on Twitch as well, uh, which is a new endeavour for me, which is the Super Arab, which, uh, backstory to the Super Arab name, 
kind of just came about like I did. Do you remember Snapchat? Do you remember the days of Snapchat? Of course I remember Snapchat. I, I, <laughs> I, had a, I, had a, I did a snap to someone who said, help me. So I sent them a snap back being like doing the Superman ripping shirt off. Like I drew a shirt and a Superman outfit underneath. <laughs> and then another friend of mine took that and photoshopped my face onto Henry Cavill's Man of Steel poster and changed it to say Super Arab. And I was like, that's great. I'm going to use that forever. <laughs> so I've been using it for the last seven years. Whoa. Yeah, seven years. <laughs> Excellent. Oh. That is very, very good. Right, well, I suppose we should try and uh, get this train a rolling and talk about uh, some tabletop stuff. Um, oh. as is... Let's talk about <laughs> Dean more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is the Dean Abdu podcast. Now. Um, Sorry, guys. Well, as is tradition, we're going to start with uh, what people are playing at the moment. Um, a glance at the dock. Doc, the only person not to fill this in is Loli, so I'm going to drop you straight in it. Loli, what have you been playing hey. over the last week? That's fine. I might not have written in the doc, but I lined them up beside me so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> Which so is I've super been... great for anyone listening to the audio-only version. Well, I'm going I'm <laughs> to talk you through them now, so that's okay. fine. Um, so I've been playing some uh, Patchwork Doodle, which is a really chill uh, roll, roll and write, yeah, roll and draw version of the uh, two-player game by uh, Uwe Rosenberg. Um, where you essentially like roll dice and then have to like color in things on a sheet and it's really lovely so I've been playing some of that I've uh, been playing another roll and write called Encore uh, which I can't really describe but you do X's and there's colors and things and mm. it's fun um, and you can play either of these one player as well so whenever nobody wants to play with me I, I can play those as well <laughs> and I actually had a go at the pandemic hot so in North America so um, one of the newer versions, uh, where which is like a shorter 30 minute version of it. And kind of when you when you read through the differences of it compared to like normal pandemic, it doesn't see feel or seem like there's a lot going on. Like you have one less thing to cure. And um, I don't know, there's like a couple of slight changes. And I was like, how different is this really going to be? But actually, it does play a lot quicker, first of all, like I um, that that um, one cure difference makes it makes it makes a difference at mm. the end of the day and um it's quite fun it's really good like it does play really quick and we had two games of it because the first game ended so quickly and us dying um <laughs> which was like mad because we were we died at the end of the day but we were also about to cure the last disease and that was like maybe a 10 15 minute game wow. um yeah yeah and then we played again and we managed to to win uh but again it wasn't like a huge amount longer so I've quite enjoyed it. I do think um, one of the things that annoyed me about it, though, is it's like described as being like this portable version, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it is. It's a smaller board and smaller cards and everything. But you open the box and there's still loads of empty space. And it's like you could have made this even more portable. Yeah. So, I mean, like it's, I don't know, it was a bit of a cop out. But otherwise, I, I recommend and it was good. Mm, good. It sounds, it sounds intriguing, like. So I think like a lot of people, Pandemic was the first sort of board game I played that really opened my eyes to the fact that tabletop games could be more than just the classics everyone grew up with. Um, but I've now played it so many times and for so long that I think I'm just sort of done with Pandemic. Like, yeah. uh, I, like I'll always have a place for it in my little heart, but I don't really want to play it anymore. Um, but I think if, but if the smaller, shorter version still gets in that thing where you're like we're so close to winning but we're also so close to failure that sort of knife edge play then i would probably check that out to be like all right well it's pandemic but yeah we'll be done in half an hour and then we can move on to something different or, or yeah, what yeah. Have you. i think it says like half an hour or less so yeah you definitely get it done and i i was very like dubious about that i was like is that really like one less disease is it really going to be half an hour but yeah yeah it was it was well nice. under half an hour so yeah, because I, think... I do like one of my problems with co-op games. Obviously, is that it's table captaining, right? Which mm -hmm. I've mentioned several times. But I did feel like I was being the table captain when we were playing because I th I think that's probably what it is though. Like somebody's always gonna be a bit of a table captain, maybe to some extent. Maybe mm. or maybe it was just me noticing that I was being that person. But yeah, it, it was you all along. It was me all along. <laughs> Lonely sometimes a great team needs a great leader. And if you need to step into that role, then fair game. It is a co-op game at the end of the day. So there's always going to be a bit of like, I don't think you should do that. I think you should do this. And then I guess it's up to the person to decide whether or not they want to go with your advice yeah. or not. 
Als um, I try with, not to do it all the time. I just I try to do it when I just thought there was a better option. You know? I try and always, if like I'm giving somebody a suggestion as to how they could take their go differently, I always try and couch it in a like, you could do that and that would also work. You might want to consider possibly doing that. I try and be as polite as possible. Um, yeah. So that if they, they say, no, I'm going to do it this way and they're wrong, I can be like, oh, well, mm, just give them enough rope, <laughs> basically. <laughs> But, oh, we all how, died, didn't we? Oh, so, mm. how terrible! What a shame! If only there weren't so many cubes in Calcutta. Actually, mm. Mm. <laughs> it made me really want to get one of the um, the legacy versions of it, though. Um, especially because we're locked in still, and it feels like we've got time to do a more epic version. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, we're still enjoying it. So, uh, I guess it gets my recommendation, whatever that's worth, Lolis. Mm. Cool. I've, um, played, I've played a couple of months of it before and I really enjoyed it so I'd like to kind of get my teeth in properly it is very good uh, well me and since you mentioned Pandemic Legacy why don't we roll straight into what you've been playing recently not not Pandemic Legacy <laughs> <laughs> my perfect segue I'm sorry we just haven't gotten around to playing it again because obviously it requires myself and my my housemate to be around sort of at the same time and around and willing instead of just sitting on the sofa and watching another episode of Queer Eye. Uh, Nothing wrong with so, that. Uh, I mean, yeah, when you're sleepy and full of food, you're like Pandemic Legacy or Feel Good Television. Hmm. Hmm. Um, no, I haven't really actually been playing a lot of board games, even Scythe. I'm really sorry. It's been a while. <laughs> Uh, I will get back on on it again, but for now we're just we just need to take a break. Me and Sai, you know, we need to go and explore other options, oh, and then no. we'll come back. That's okay. Oh, no, you'll um, never get back together, will you? That's. <laughs> oh, you uh, will. It's, it's risk. It's a risky area when you're saying we're gonna we're gonna go on a break, but uh, we'll see we'll see if we're paths again. <laughs> well, you can. I mean, I, there are always board games where you have like a really intense love with of them, and you're like, we're playing scythe. When are we next playing scythe? When are we next playing scythe? And then, you know, you don't play it for a while, and then you sit down and play, and it's like meeting up with an ex, where you sort of have a coffee and you smile sadly at each other, being like, oh, I wouldn't for all the world go back to this full time, but you know what? We had some fun, didn't we? That's how I feel about Sai. Uh, no, I actually still <laughs> love Sai. I'd still take Sai out on a date. Hey. Um, yeah, yeah, I take. It was hot and heavy for a while. But it's cool. I mean, Sai is a heavy board game. Like that thing, yeah. that's a hernia maker. There's a lot there. Yeah. There's it's, a lot there to get your hands. Don't get me wrong. It's um, not Gloomhaven, but you know. <laughs> anyway, um, now that we've had that relationship analogy mm-hmm. fully dealt with. Um, I guess I've been playing, um, well, as some people might have already seen, uh, last week we played the, well not last I week. I regret to inform um, you it was Monday of this week that we I did know. that. I <laughs> know. It's been a long week. It though. really has. Um, we played the Desperados free RPG mm. um, that is currently available on the website, the Desperados free website. Yeah, and you can get it on Drive Through RPG. If you basically just search oh, yeah. Desperados RPG, it will come up, and you can get it entirely for free. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we played that as a group, uh, and it was very straightforward. It was very simple. Like it took me a few minutes to make my character. Um, the character creation system is very straightforward. Um, you can get a few skills, but it's very much like pared down. Uh, there's an interesting like dueling mechanic, which is kind of like Deadlands, mm. um, but you select a number on the die, and then you're like, "That's how many rounds I'm gonna wait until I shoot." And the longer you wait, the more uh, powerful your shot will be, and the more likely it will hit mm. your opponent. Uh, so we did. That might have happened during the playthrough, spoiler alert. Um, but also, uh, yeah, we were just rooting and tooting. Uh, my character had a gun called Mrs. Nesbit. <laughs> yeah, that really made me giggle. I wasn't in this playthrough, but I did edit it for the YouTube channel. Uh, for, for clarity and transparency, uh, it was a sponsored video, so um, that's yeah. up there because Desperados 3 is a video game that's coming out with lots of sort of heavy tactical combat 
Uh, so the RPG is kind of designed to simulate that uh, in a sort of rooty tooty pen and paper cowboy shooty sort of way. Uh, but yeah, yeah. When, uh, when you reached into your skirts and pulled out a rifle called Mrs. Nesbitt, I nearly uh, spat coffee on my keyboard. So thanks for that. It was good fun. Yeah. I was um, my character, for anyone who didn't get uh, the reference, my character was really inspired by Mae West, the uh, actress who did a lot of Western films. The kind of Western films that were also comedies as well. Mm. Of of the era, um, I think it was like four thirties, forties, something like that. And she's got she had this amazing accent that I was trying to do. That's just like it 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 like portrays such a uh, an element of just I'm so tired with everyone else yeah. and I'm done with their their kind of rubbish. Uh, but she had such a an element of style to her, and she was quite, for the time, quite progressive on screen in terms of like how much agency she had. She did a lot of kind of semi raunchy comedy, at least again, for the era. So I kind of like I want to play a character like this, mm. and I hope uh, that came across in the, in the playthrough. For what it's worth, um, I think the voice really worked because I was gonna send you a clip. I forgot to in the end, but um, there's a. Is, has anyone heard of What's My Line? This is like an old uh, yeah. TV show. Right, okay. I, think I used to I've watch it. it. It's really yeah. good. It's, it's awesome. Like, it's, it's an old TV show. So they've got all these clips, sort of black and white, and they have a panel of celebrities, and they bring people on, and they get to ask them yes or no questions and try and work out what line of business they're in. Uh, it sounds relatively, you know, uh, straightforward and kind of dull until you realise that they have guests in, like, Salvador Dali. They have the actual Colonel Sanders from KFC. Uh, they have Alfred Hitchcock in there. They have Ronald it's Reagan. It's so good. It's, um, good. it's incredible. You can find a lot of these clips on YouTube and they're they're incredible watching. They blindfold them when um, when people are, are, are famous enough to recognise on site. The funny thing is they don't blindfold Colonel Sanders. So even though you see him and you're like, well, that's Colonel Sanders, that's the chicken man. Um, that's the chicken uh, man. Like, it, they're all like, what do you, what is it you do? And they've kind of got all that, like, Hollywood voice in there. But the Salvador Dali one, there's a, a lady in that, I can't remember her name, but she sounds, you sounded exactly like her. So you kind of nailed it, that kind of like, well, I don't know about that, but murmur, murmur, like that sort of tired, yeah, yeah, yeah. but powerful Hollywood, like, leading lady voice. I, th- I think <laughs> you did very well. Yeah, well, thank you. Mm. And um, I'm sure Johnny will go into further detail, but... We've also been playing some Deadland this week. Oh, so, have we ever. Cowboy, cowboy RPGs all around. Mm. I feel like I'm basically in the Wild West now. I mean, it's boiling hot. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to go outside mm-hmm. because of, the, I guess, the outlaws out there. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've been living the life of the Wild West. Mm. Um, be sure to check your boots for snakes. Um, Dean Abdu, how about you? Uh, what have you been playing this week? Um, I don't know how often you sort of get the time to to talk uh, to <laughs> play tabletop games. Um, but yeah, what's what's been taking up your time this week? This week, I have been playing Dropmix. Oh! Dropmix. This is what I've been playing. Um, I got it literally last week, uh, and I've not been able to stop playing. So like. For those who who might not know what Dropmix is, Dropmix is a music mixing board game where you literally have a deck of cards with different samples from a variety of songs. So you've got like a card which is Evanescence vocals, uh, Bring Me to Her Life, or um, uh, Disturbed Down With The Sickness, which is vocals, drums, synths, uh, guitar, like which you could place. On a, wherever you want on the board and and there's a variety of different game modes to play so you have to it's a bluetooth little device the board that i just showed up uh, to the to, to the boat to the audio listeners i held up a board earlier i'm sorry <laughs> should have said that uh but there's a bluetooth uh board that you connect to an app on your phone and then you'll get a variety of game modes you get freestyle mode which is literally you can just make your own mixes uh, which is what i've been doing for the majority of the time is just placing down these cards and with some smart magic algorithm that i'm not going to pretend to understand <laughs> it just like matches it all up so that you've got these 
tracks just nicely playing, or sometimes not nicely playing, like... Disturbs down with the sickness constantly just ruins everything, <laughs> no matter what. So, like... <laughs> but it's great, because as soon as you put it down, it'll do the, the, the little chime to say it's about to remix everything, and then it'll open with the the, icon- the iconic... Wah! And I was like, ah! Yeah! And then it goes downhill. I was like, okay, cool. That, that's all I wanted. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, free, freestyle mode is a lot of fun. You can just make your own mixes. You can even save them to the app, and you can share them with other people. A what? Um, I know, yeah, right. Like this is like this, my sister when she got it a few months ago was just constantly sending me uh, like videos on Facebook, which is just all of her mixes. And like, stop it! I, I don't have the money to get this game, but I really want to get this game. <laughs> and and you know, lo and behold, lockdown helped me <laughs> save up money to get this game, and that's why I've been playing it. Uh, I even incorporated the freestyle mode into a stream because you know how streamers they usually have like uh some kind of like lo-fi beats or something playing as a sound bed yeah. underneath all their gameplay like for the longest time i was trying to figure out how to do that with my 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 own setup but then i as soon as drop mix came in and i started playing with it i was like i wonder how i can make this the device that does provides the music for all my streams uh and then so i just got on like an aux cable to hook up my phone into the little mini mixing desk i've got on my uh on my desk uh, and then i got an, a program called visor which lets me uh screen share my phone screen so in, in my stream when there's gameplay at the bottom right you'll see the phone screen showing where all the tracks are and then you can just like hear hear what's being played through the stream and mm. i said to the viewers like you know when whenever you you want a new card to be placed down just let me know and i'll whack down a new card and we'll get a new beat and it'll it'll be fun <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I'm well proud of that. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good use of um, it. Because, like, Drop Mix is magical. Like, at yeah. Alex's, have you played it? No. It's No, I've had people talk to me about it, but... I think you'd both love it. Like, when it first came out, I remember somebody in the the office got, got a copy. And in the boardroom, there was just a, a group of people who were standing there just silently just staring at it. And occasionally someone would just lean in and whap a card down and the whole thing would change. Um, I was, this is back when I worked on Eurogamer, I was recording next door. Um, the sound bleed was quite bad. So we were like, you know, we were recording something. We were taking a break. And then we were like, oh, they're playing, they're playing that drop mix thing. Blah, blah, blah. And then I heard Evanescence come in. I was like, I'll be back. And I just kicked the door <laughs> and it was like, ah, oh, bring me to life. It was, oh, it was delightful. <laughs> it is just so much fun it's one of those things that you think you'd get bored of very very quickly um but you don't it's kind of like uh you know like uh beasts of balance where you're like oh, okay yeah it's cute you stack the things up on the thing and then the, the phone or the tablet shows you a new monster creature thing that you've made that's cute uh but you still just keep want to keep playing it it is it is exactly that it's a it's a heckin delight how many cards it's do you get so in the fun. game uh i so the 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 just the game itself you get provided with 60 cards uh but you can buy packs to add more cards into your deck so they got like the pop pack or the electronic pack or like just like a discovery pack where it's full of random cards i think there's even a classic pack where there's beethoven in there (laughs) so like you know remixing some beethoven with evanescence is definitely something on my to-do list to down in the future Um, yeah but look, it looks a like lot it's like twenty quid. It seems really good. It's for, for so me. cheap. Like yeah. it's like so. Where when my sister first got it, it was like still around thirty thirty five, and then now it's about twenty quid. I was like, well, uh, I'm the winner here. Are you about <laughs> um, to ask him if you financed it? <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. I've got it. It's it's all good. Sorry, um, that's a that's a prior, that's a joke. That's an a, office it's joke. It's Sorry about that. Inside <laughs> joke. Okay. Audiences don't need to know about it. <laughs> Dino, would you like to explain why it's so cheap, though? This is the sad bit. It is. Oh, oh no. I bit. don't know why you it's so know. cheap. If we were Please playing drop mix me. right now, we'd be dropping some sad violin cards on the deck right now. Yeah, definitely. Oh, no. Um, essentially, from again, uh, I don't have all the details. From what I know, it's basically been discontinued. So, um, yeah... Well, all the cars that are available now are the only ones that you can get. Snap um, them up while you can. I was just going to say, yeah. you'd think they'd, they'd hike up the price, though, Joe. Mm. <sighs> well, I think it's the case of that there wasn't enough demand for the cost of of making the product, I think. Yeah. I think that's what happened. Licensing so all they... those tracks can't be cheap, can it? 
Yeah, so obviously Buying you invested a lot of right money. Right now, because that'll be somebody's Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's so much fun. Um, yeah. I thoroughly enjoy it. So when you're not... They might... Sorry, carry on. They, they might go up in price when people start getting their hands on them, but for now I yeah. think they're fairly cheap. So I guess buy one now if you want This one. feels like insider trading. Like, <laughs> get one now because the price is going to skyrocket once they listen to the Dicebreaker podcast episode 13. Oh, yeah. <laughs> People are going to be mugging one another on the way home for their copies yeah, we'll of be, Drop Mix. We'll be on a Wikipedia page for, like, the great economic crash of, like, 2020. Um, I, I'd like to think there are other mitigating factors that are, are leading us into a global recession right now, but let's, you know what, we'll keep it bright and breezy. Um, <laughs> Dean, when you're not dropping fat beats, what other kind of tabletop games do you enjoy? Because I know you've you've sort of, in many, like, especially when we were just starting up Dicebreaker, you were our ace in the hole in that we needed people to play games with and, like, we didn't have many people on the Dicebreaker staff. So we were like, Dean, you come play a game with us. Uh, but what, always key to play games. What are your favourites? Uh, my favourites is a good question. Uh, I I can tell you my favourite kind of genre of games, which mm-hmm. is social deduction games, uh, and that's very much thanks to Lolies introducing me to that whole subsect of games. Like so, before before Lolies was at Dice Dicebreaker, and before I even was at Gamer Network, like we met at a loading bar. It was, it was me and a, when I was still in PR, we were doing a colleague. Uh, and like they needed Lolis and the group of friends that she was with needed extra players and so we were just like hello and then our friendship circle grew and then we became best of friends ever since and Aww. I know it's best of friends because I said that many a times to her at a house party very drunkenly uh, yeah so I've got, I've got you saved friends. as my bestie in my phone so. yeah Aww. <laughs> uh, but yeah social deduction games are super super fun and one that mm-hmm. I really really like and I don't play enough of is human punishment which yeah. Is, uh, yeah, I've been trying to get so the adorable. guys in the office to play it, but it's one of those ones I'd have to teach, and there's like the, you kind of it's a bit confusing at the beginning, and it's always been like when it when we play games in the office, it's it feels like it's more of a lighter thing, or it's stuff that we're doing for video. So and you need like quite a big group of people like to make it really good because it plays like four to sixteen people. Mm. So good. Sorry. It is. It's <laughs> a lot of fun, and I mean. There's probably the chaotic nature in me, but I just love the heated debates that social deduction games bring out in people and, like, how tense it gets is, like, who can you trust? Who can you, who can you not trust? Like, is anybody really your friend? Who knows? <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> the great thing about human punishment, for anyone who, do, who isn't aware of it, it's a, it's a social deduction game, as many social deduction games, except um, you've got three different factions. You've got robots, humans, and outlaws. Um, and so robots and humans are obviously trying to get rid of each other. Um, outlaws are out for themselves, so they play, they're on the team just by themselves. They're not even teamed up with other outlaws. And you could, you've got three cards in front of you, and it's the combination of the three cards that tell you what faction you're with. But the thing is that throughout the game, those cards can change, so your alliances can change. And all of a sudden, you go from being a human to being a robot and like turning on the people you've been working with so there was a game that dean and i played on another stream actually where <laughs> we were both uh robots or something i can't remember we were let's just say we were robots and um yeah. and we there was like the group was like half robots half humans and i think there was like one outlaw or something and we were as as robots we were about to win the game um like in a number of turns and i decided that one of the guys on our team i didn't want him to win with us so i made i turned him into a human because i was like oh i don't want you to win with us right i turned him into a human and then slowly (laughs) turn after turn everybody else turned into humans as well until i was the only robot left and i was like oh damn what have i done i've gone from almost winning to like ruining everything i managed to turn dean back into a robot again and together we managed to win the game. Like we managed to claw our way back, but it was so dramatic. And it's like, <laughs> it's one of the best social deduction games, um, in my opinion. It's there so was good. so nearly a valuable lesson in that, but you pulled it back <laughs> anyway and won. So you're like, actually, yeah. no, I think it's fine to tell one of the kids that they can't sit with us. That's all right. <laughs> wow. Oh, God. 
It was, it was, I think, yeah, it was easily one of my favorite moments ever. And I'm so happy that it's on video forever for people to watch. So if anybody's curious about it, yes, it's please. over on the, it's on the Big Potato Games YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The annoying thing is they cut it so it looks like I lost. They cut it at the end, so it doesn't actually show that I that we won at the end. Suspicious. So, so really, technically, you lost because the evidence, otherwise, you know, <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah. You lost. Yeah, they say history is written by the winners, but uh, on YouTube, it's written by the people who edit and publish the videos. The video, so, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, oh god. What have you what been have playing, I... Johnny? Well. Um, <laughs> As per usual, I've been playing a lot of Deadlands because it's just my life, really. Um, I'm running two campaigns and playing in one, which just started this week and is lovely. Um, I'm playing a, a plucky, like, 13 or 14 year old, he doesn't know how old he is, um, kid who's just sort of like been wandering the West in search of adventure because he's obsessed with uh, detective stories, um, like the stories of Chet Washburn, like little five cent pulp things so he ran away from the orphanage where he was living and he's like i'm gonna go find adventure and it's really nice to play a character that's not like a grizzled like oh, i'm gonna kill you for looking me the wrong way kind of guy like it, it's it, oddly it's a really hopeful posse like everyone put together a, a character that's like not got a grim backstory and just sort of has ambitions um and obviously you know we'll be tarnished by the events of the weird west but you know we'll get to that when we get to it um, oh. Apart from that, I have spent a lot of time painting uh, recently. Um, I basically... So when Twilight Imperium 4 came out, uh, a bunch of my friends got it. So we were playing TI4 all the time. And I had a copy of Twilight Imperium 3. And I was like, well, I'm clearly not going to play this anymore. So uh, I went on my local Warhammer group and I was like, does anyone want this game? And does anyone want to trade it for Skaven? And there was a guy who was like, yeah, i got a sack of them. So I met up with him in a pub and we did this Sacker. weird sort of handoff where I gave him an enormous like coffin sized board game <laughs> and he handed me this small plastic bag full of little plastic rats. Um, so I've just been chewing through those like uh, I've got a little Tupperware tray on my desk with uh, a few miniatures um, so that at any point I'll be, like if I'm looking down I'll be like there they are. They're always kind of in my head. So a lot of the time I'll be like well all I need to do is fill up my paint pot and uh yeah, we'll get going. So I've just been sort of chipping away at them. It's been nice. Um, it does mean that I'm spending a lot more of my free time at this desk where I spend all of my time at work, uh, which is probably doing terrible things to my health. But I'm um, I'm happy. So yeah, I'm just painting rats good. basically. That's that's it's, what I've been up to. Going back to your deadlines thing, it's interesting that you've gone from someone who famously. Um, mushed up uh, orphans to to build an orphanage to plague an orphan <laughs> oh i didn't even think about that um <laughs> and if that isn't a sentence that requires some heavy context i don't know what is um <laughs> it's a reference to the ox venture which is the D series uh i dm for outside xbox and outside extra two of sort of our sister channels uh and the, they have a an army of skeletons that live in a hammer um who will do their bidding but always find a way to sneak in a horrible consequence. So, for example, they tried to use the skeletons to fix up a town. They tried to fix up the town hall, which they did, but they did that by dismantling the orphanage. So then they were like, fix the orphanage. So they did, but they ground up the orphans and made them into cement, um, which apparently is a real thing. Like, Whoa! blood mortar is a real thing. Like, uh, they used to use ox blood. Like, the Roman Colosseum, part of the reason it's still standing today is that they mixed a bunch of blood in with the the mortar uh which just makes it super strong so um i didn't know that at the time but it turns well, out like an ox you know that's how engineering works yeah. right you get something that has an essence of something like an ox yeah and then you put it in the building yeah and that building takes on its essences and therefore become strong it's just basic science here johnny we're just taking basic science well, what about when people say someone's built like a brick s house <laughs> did you think about that one yeah should we do some news P people work differently from buildings johnny <laughs> okay hey oh, it's boy. time for the news <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, like the medieval... Oh, she's still going. No. She's still going. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> style of humours, you know, stuff like that. I'm calling it now. We're doing the news. <laughs> We got three stories uh, this week. The first one is a uh, uh, is all about uh, role player adventures, uh, the co-op sequel to the original Fantasy Dice game. Alex, me and you wrote this story. Um, I did. I'm sorry, it was me. I own up to it. No, it's a good it's a good story about what I think is quite an interesting game. Uh, do you want to give us the skinny on it, or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um... <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Don't get too excited. Yeah. All yeah right, okay. Fine. Whatever. Um. Yeah, so, Role Player Adventures, which I have to say, not a hugely imaginative name. Um, considering that Role Player, the first game, is like a, it's like a, a pun on, like, rolling dice mm-hmm. and being, you know, role playing a character. Mm-hmm. So, like, in the first Role Player, the whole game is you just making a fantasy hero character by rolling dice and like assigning skills and attributes to that character and like buying equipment for them and basically getting them through hero university uh, and then um, in role player adventures you can choose to um, use that character in this new game so you can like import the character uh, in this game, you're like going around a kingdom, you know, your classic Higi Higi, there's a king and there's some <laughs> presumably some monsters or whatever, uh, and you've got to kill them, or you can choose to work with them. You know, whatever, maybe you see the monster's point of view. Uh-huh. It's, it's not so straightforward. Um, but that you see, that's where the pun kind of doesn't work so much. Well, it's cause... a sequel. Like, you know, I didn't hear you complaining that Pandemic Hot Zone is just pandemic with the word hot zone on the end. <laughs> hot zone. Yeah, but pandemic was never a pun. Okay, bad example. Role player is a pun. And now it's just, now the name is just a generic fantasy thing. But, you know, the game looks fun. Um, <laughs> I like the fact that you can actively just be hired to go and save the kingdom and decide actually no I'm gonna sorry guys I've decided I'm gonna go with these these people you can't be a robot um, anymore etc etc yeah exactly um, and I like the art style um, it's quite fun hmm. um, I think it sounds nice on... I like the idea of, of playing role player and getting a character together and then someone being like well yeah. do you want to play a game with that character and you'd be like hell yeah and then they pop open yeah. the box complain about the, how the pun falls apart and then you just get on with it. I think that's nice. Exactly. I, I mean, like, it's the perfect kind of game to play back-to-back, I guess. Yeah. Um, depends how much time you have. But um, it's currently on Kickstarter um, until July 17th. Mm. Uh, and then apparently it's estimated to kind of arrive uh, 2021 20, in June. So uh, if you're interested in that game... Firstly, read the news piece on the website, mm-hmm. dicebreaker.com. And secondly, no, go no, and no. have a look at the Kickstarter page. Oh, you know what? Slowly. I'm looking at it now. This board game is is what might be slightly painfully described as a heck in chonker. Oh, yeah. It's enormous. Okay. That's why it's like 80 quid. Yeah, it's 80 quid or $100 to get a copy of the game. I kind of, to be honest with you, from the description, I kind of assumed that these would be two fairly sort of lightweight games that you can sort of smash out in an hour, an hour and a half, sort of playing both. Oh, no. No. And it's not that at all, is it? Well, I think there are multiple... So there are 11 possible adventures for you to play through. Mm-hmm. And I think every adventure has its own storybook. So off the bat, you've got 11 different storybooks. You've also got, like, a side, pl- side quest you can replay... Um, and kind of do it in multiple different ways. Hmm. Um, there are like preset characters and ways to make your own character. There's also dice, because that's how you do skill checks and combat. And I think there are miniatures in there as well. Yeah. So when you take that into account, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a heckin' chonk. It is, yeah. Okay, well, uh, talking of things that are on Kickstarter coming to an end soon, uh, this week we also had a look at Intrepid which is the uh, asymmetric cooperative uh, survive in space because the International Space Station's gone very wrong sort of game. 
It's not a genre, yeah. it's just a cat candid description. Houston, we have a problem. Um, but, I mean, Alex, me and you wrote this story as well. You're all <laughs> over know. Dicebreaker.com. Uh, I'm like a rash. Oh, <laughs> all over the, the website. <laughs> Can't get rid of um, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no cream's going to get rid of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome okay, to the podcast, just... Dean. Yep. <laughs> yeah, hi, Dean. Um, yeah, Intrepid is also a game that's up on Kickstarter right now. Um, it's made by the same uh, Jeff Beck who who co-created Hardback, which is like a prequel to Paperback, hmm. which is quite a popular deck-building word game. What about Nickelback? Like we don't talk about Nickelback, not on this podcast, yeah, not while I'm running it. Kind of Evanescence, yes, Nickelback, no. I don't know what kind of affiliations, if any, that uh, he has with, with Nickelback. But, um, what about Hardback? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it, this game is not much like Hardback at all, though. Um, it's a co-op game where you basically work together as a team to survive uh, on a space station that is basically having a really awful time. Uh, things are just going wrong everywhere. Mm. You know, there's, there's, I don't know, there's guns in the pipes or something. I don't know how space station works. <laughs> uh, uh, presumably, there's guns somewhere, and if it gets in the pipes, it's bad. Yeah, um, yeah space guns. Yeah, 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 yeah. Space guns. Well-known problem. You want it to stay in the tank, but not get in the pipes, and that's where yeah. so many people go wrong, actually. Exactly. Uh, you know, as a, as a self-described scientist, I would say watch out for space guns. But, um, yeah, so everyone, it's asymmetric, meaning... Basically, space gun or space jam? Sorry. <laughs> uh, you know what, I actually appreciate that. I like the way that. <laughs> that you waited just long enough for me to, like... Move on to. <laughs> you know, yeah, she, and then you're like, no, hang on. She thinks she's going to be on to the next sentence, her. but she's wrong. I'm going to pull her right back into this this tank full of space jam. <laughs> wow. She, they need to hear about space jam, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's asymmetric, meaning that depending on what role you choose to play. Um, you'll have kind of a different experience individually. So uh, different characters have different difficulty ratings because each character has like a like a different way of interacting with the different puzzles and disasters. So uh, like I think th there are certain characters who need certain numbers to pass tests, but they also can only roll dice in a certain way. Um, and yeah, it's described as being very hard. So, mm. you know, if you want to challenge yourself, uh, and it's up on Kickstarter until July 9th. Mm. Uh, um, it, and it feels like a lot of space games are, are really hard. I don't know if it's just me. I just feel like sp space games as a genre tend to be really quite difficult. Like yeah, um, like, like Star Realms. <laughs> yep. Of course. Or, um, yeah. <laughs> What's what's that one from? Uh, is it Vlada Khatil? Um, where you talk about the captain is dead? Uh, not the captain is dead. It's the one where you play an audio track, and you know where your um, you are in the ship, but you're not allowed to track your movement with a meeple or anything, and you have to respond to these things in real time by playing cards, um, and then you resolve them all at once. And if you get it wrong, if you tell your guy to go left and he goes right you're suddenly going off and just blindly pushing buttons and mashing things in the wrong part of the ship, and it can be really, really difficult. This sounds cool. This is, I've never I'm heard of this gonna game. going to have to Google this. Uh, yeah. Space board game, MP3 Ooh. tracks, blah, Or, oh, like, Nemesis. Like, that's meant to be quite hard. Yeah. That's another space game. Or the crew. Space alert. Really hard? Space alert. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, it's very, very good. But well, you know, space is a scary place, Strong. It is. I mean... It's full of gunge. I, You've got to be careful. It's absolutely chock full of gunge and jam and possibly aliens. 
Um, I mean, I think, for example, the, the Battlestar Galactica board game, even if you take out the fact that one of you, or possibly more, is a hidden traitor, that's, just, that's a hard game to survive. It's difficult. Things yeah. go wrong a lot. Mm. Space. It's turns out it's hard to live there. Madness. Yeah. There you go. This is the, the Dean Abdu and Science podcast. Yes. I'm all on board because I love Dean Abdu and I love science. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, if you colonised a new planet, Dean, what would you call it? Uh, I think, I genuinely, I think I'd, I'd, uh, I'd do, I'd call it the same thing that we called that game that we started way back when, uh, that never finished, the game where we started all the villages and cities, and I, I called my city uh, Wahran, which is like party central in Algeria, in, play, in case people don't know. So I want to think my, pl my planet will be party central, and so therefore come to planet Wahran, and it's going to be great. Wahran. I'm sold. That's a cool, that's a fun <laughs> word to say as well, Wahran. It is, yeah. It's it's weirdly so it's it's the only place that I know that has two names. So like, you know, uh, when you're in Algeria, you, you refer to it as uh, Wahran. But when when outside of Algeria, like it, people call call it uh, Oran. Um, hmm. I'm not too sure what the science is behind it, or or, or the logistics well, or the history or whatever it is that it, it dictates names for cities. But yeah. Huh. Mm. As Little. a science podcasting, maybe we need to investigate this. We need yeah. to come up with a theory. Yeah, <laughs> a theory to why it's got two names. I tell you what, we'll yeah. we'll biff off the news next week, and if you can just come back and present your findings, uh, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get my lab coat. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. We got nice. one last news story to to run through. I'll I'll jet us through it very quickly before we get on to the games that are coming up because shock horror, there are actually some things coming out. <gasps> Um, but Project Nisei is that how you s say it? I don't want to be a Nisei yeah, about this. Nisei. Nisei. You don't want to be a Nisei, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically, uh, Project Nisei. Okay, uh, is the fan-made follow-up to Android Netrunner, which of course uh, was uh, an immensely popular uh, living card game published by Fantasy yeah, Flight Richard before it was. Garfield cancelled in 2018 yeah as a, a richard garfield sort of well it's android netrunner was a reboot of the original netrunner right which richard garfield um sort of uh came up with um and yeah basically it was the the license was up for renewal wasn't it and then it just sort of wasn't renewed yeah it was just license issues because essentially fantasy flight owned the rights yeah um Oh, I think I think Wizards of the Coast owned the rights, and then Fantasy Flight started publishing it. And then when it came up for renewal with the rights, yeah, they basically just went. I think there were just issues, and Fantasy Flight were like, "We can't be bothered to deal with this." So, mm. despite the fact that the game is as popular as it is, yeah. you think they would have bothered? But uh, yeah, I kind it, of assumed they were getting the rights back so that they could launch their own using that mechanic. It's a, you know, here's a clue, listeners and viewers. The world of the tabletop industry is, it's a, it's a bit of a wild one. And sometimes things don't really make sense. Uh, but you just got to roll with it. You know? Yeah. Roll with it. Oh, um, well, Project Nis Nisai, I, I don't know why I'm so afraid of trying to pronounce that name. Uh, it's basically an unofficial continuation slash reboot yeah. of Android Netrunner, um, and yeah, it is getting a major new starter set this year, which is nice, if yeah. you're into that sort of thing. It's the, it's, it's the first lot of starter sets ever released for Project Nisai, so uh, before they just release expansions, whereas this is specifically designed to get people into Project Nisai. Uh, and they've also got a set of updated decks coming as well. So essentially, they're they're now bringing loads of new cards that people can use without having like a copy of Netrunner. So they're making it their own while still being like, you could still play Netrunner with this because people like Netrunner. Mm. I think it's smart. It's kind of you know, it's it's a way of as you say, getting more people in without them, you know, without mandating that they were Netrunner players. Yeah. So it's like um, Hannah Montana might say. It's the best of both worlds. Wow, that is the last yeah. thing that I thought was going to fall out of your mouth uh, when we were talking about uh, expandable card games. But there it is. <laughs> uh, it's always a surprise, this podcast. 
think it's fair Keep to people say. People on their toes. Yeah. All right. Uh, let us move on to what's coming up because uh, let's start with the, with the big one because um, Magic the Gathering's core set 2021 is obviously about to release. It's out at the very start of next month. Uh, that'll be nice for people who like Magic the Gathering. Obviously, you know, it is a huge, huge game and there are lots of people who try and keep up with the core sets every year. Um, more excitingly, if you're me, uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective has another new edition, uh, which is the Baker Street Irregulars, which is, um, you know what, I've never actually played Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, uh, despite the fact I think it would be right up my street. Um, the dog up I never shut up street. about, Watson, is named after Holmes and Watson, right up my Baker Street. I'm so sorry I talked over that pun. That was amazing. <laughs> has anyone got a saxophone? Let's put this right. <laughs> Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is basically a, a co-op game where uh, you have cases to solve and you have a bunch of sort of paper artifacts like newspapers and, and things like that that you can choose to sort of have a look at and you mark down how many things you look at before you build your hypothesis and basically say that you've cracked the case. At which point you find out how, how right or wrong you were and you compare your score against Sherlock Holmes's. Because is, 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 is. Yeah. if you yes. can do it in fewer basically sort of detective actions then Holmes, then you've done really well if not mm. don't worry about it too much like it's sherlock holmes he's a pretty smart guy uh well, this is the fun part about the game you, yeah you obviously you're not sherlock holmes you're like trying to show up sherlock holmes yeah. but if you don't beat him he has like a little paragraph that's like that's basically burns you <laughs> like <laughs> it's like it's savage but in a very polite way mm. uh, so that's a fun part of that game yeah it's and like so the baker street irregulars um in sherlock holmes are basically it's his term for all of the little street urchins that he will give a penny to to go spy on someone or or whatever there's all the people like mr holmes i've, I've found a I've found a clue so uh presumably it's oh here we go actually you and your fellow players are Wiggins Baker Street Irregulars. Um, so you you will be playing as Victorian urchins. Um, oh, fantastic! Yeah, I was going to say if there's like, if ever <laughs> this game could be more Alex Meehan, uh, it's now. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite exciting. Like, I, I again, I've never played this game partly because a lot of my friends have have played it so much that whenever they talk about it, they're like, "Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, we should play that again sometime." And clearly have no like urgent need to, but. Um, as I understand it, it's a brilliant game where you can just sort of sit around and chew over a case. Or, you know, you can be playing at a table and go for a walk and still be talking about it and coming up with hypotheses. Um, I've, I've Actually, my friends and I have even talked about trying to play it by post during the sort of the uh, government order quarantine during COVID-19. Sidebar, I hope everyone's staying safe. Um, it's, yeah, this is kind of a beloved um, detective-y game. Uh, and there's a free prequel demo, actually, uh, available if you want to check it out, but you're not sure whether or not you want to buy it and become a Victorian street urchin. Because, let's face it, it sounds charming, but um, disease was quite, uh, you know, you, you could die quite easily from that as a, as a Victorian child. Keep it, yeah, Keeping it breezy. Fun. Well done, Johnny. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Lovely stuff. <laughs> Christ alive. Okay. Uh, what, what else is? What else do we have to look forward to, Johnny? Spicy. Spicy. Which I, we're not sure if this that's how it's officially meant to be said. Spicy. Uh, yeah, spicy. Which is basically I picked this one because I saw this when it was announced ages ago, and I thought mm. Alex beautiful. It's basically it's so pretty. I just looked it up while uh, while I was talking about consumption. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's so pretty. I lo I would hang that tiger on my wall on the front mm. cover. It's great. Uh, mm. uh, the tagline of this game is "Big Cats and Hot Bluffing," <laughs> which is great fun. Um, yeah, I'm sounds sold. Suggesting. Yeah, well, hot cats and big bluffing would be um, <laughs> would be worse, I imagine. Um, um, I don't yeah, know. I... <laughs> I'm Each gonna... of their own, oh, yeah. uh, Johnny. Okay. Sorry. No, no yeah. <laughs> 
I'm going to read you the blurb because uh, there's a, there's funnily enough there's a story behind this this bluffing game. Once upon a time, three big cats became exhausted fighting to be top cat. They agreed to quit the fight and spice up their nine lives with a hot spice eating contest. Alas, everyone was soon cheating, so the cats invented a very hot, often tearful bluffing game. So it's it's kind of you know it's it's a another game kind of in the vein of uh, Kakalak and poker or um, or skull where you're kind of putting stuff down. You're saying like. You know, you make wages and you can say, like, you can challenge people, um, you can up the numbers, uh, or you can say the number on this card is correct and force uh, the the cat who uh, played the last card to pick them all up. It all sounds relatively sort of straightforward, but the art style in this one is, is absolutely gorgeous. They're kind of mm-hmm. sort of like... Um, Southeast Asian-inspired sort of, uh, like, lovely paintings on... Um, on yeah, with lovely colourful backgrounds and stuff, it's um it's gorgeous. And if you like games about cats eating spicy things, uh, this one's right up your alley. Yeah. So, if yeah, I covered this game when it was announced um a while back, and um the the element of the spiciness is that when you claim you are playing a level of spiciness, the next player has to play that level or above. Mm-hmm. So if you're bluffing and you don't have that level of spiciness, then you get called out and you have to take yeah the the cards. Uh, but yeah, if you want to feed a cat something spicy without you know doing that in real life, <laughs> this is the way to do it. One of my two cats actually loves spice. Um, genuinely, like she she's kind of stopped doing it quite so much. But whenever my wife would make like really spicy pasta, the cat would just be on her shoulder being like, guess a bit of that. Um, <laughs> so she would. She'd give her a little tiny bit of pasta with loads of cayenne pepper on it, and the cat would, would oh. absolutely love it. Oh, I don't mm. think what that would do to their insides, <laughs> honestly. Knowing what cat stomachs are like. Yeah. <laughs> Vividly knowing. Yeah. Oh, no. no comment. Uh, no, she's fine. She's in, she's in rude health. Uh, and indeed, she's a rude cat, so... All's well. Ooh. Why don't we move on to some questions from the audience? Oh. Yay! Thank you. That's the kind of enthusiasm <laughs> we're looking for. Um, Mian, do you want to take this first one, which comes from David K? Oh, my goodness. Uh, right. <clears throat> David K asks, or says, Hi, Dicebreaker team. Hello. Um... <laughs> enjoying your family friendly content you know of course which is refreshing and the occasional family style bickering uh, oops I meant enthusiastic interplay <laughs> yeah we'll call it that hmm. um, here's the background to my question I had my first go at playing Power Grid uh, I don't know what that is I, it's but, a uh, heavy game it is heavy uh, it took 40 minutes to set up the board, then we tried playing around, got stuck on the, fir- the fourth phase and decided this wasn't fun, so played Kittens in a Blender instead. Uh, I really hope that that's a board game. Uh, I felt a bit deflated not being able to grasp the rules of Power Grid, especially since my son said it came highly recommended and I wanted to see him enjoy himself wiping the grid with me. Uh, here's the question. Uh, if I don't understand the mechanics of Power Grid, is it because one, my IQ is too low? It said recommended age was 13 plus. <laughs> the designer's IQ is too high. Uh, the rules are not clear. Some games need tutorials to be understood. Uh, I should stick to blending kittens because all I really want to do is have laughs with my son. Uh, or six, all of the above sad face. Uh, wishing you all a safe and mentally stable time. Uh, kind regards, uh, David K. P- P.S. We love Kit. Um, I'd li- I never doubted that. I'd like to point out that for a second point, the designer's IQ is too high. In brackets, it says my ad- my adult son muttered something about German game designers, which I very much enjoyed. <laughs> uh, and it is pretty bang on the money. Um, I I would say David K. Don't beat yourself up about this. Uh, Power Grid yeah. is a is a, a gnarly one to get to grips with the first time. 
Um, Power Grid, I've never played myself, but when I used to work at a board game cafe, it was one of those games, I think we had one or two copies, <clears throat> and I never ever taught it, obviously, because it's just one of those games, we were like, if somebody really wants to play this, they can sit themselves down and learn it, because it would it would have taken so much of our time to like mm. sit down with somebody, um, but I just remember it being a very, it was like in the heaviest of heavy sections, like within the kind of board game library layout kind of thing so. yeah might as well have a sign saying <laughs> prepare yourself this is this is gonna be a big yeah mm-hmm. it's one of those games where people genuinely start hitting their heads on the on the table when the, the rules are being explained um like i genuinely i genuinely think it is a very good game but it is hard to keep the momentum and enthusiasm up when you're learning it for the first time uh, I just think it takes a few few goes round to get to grips with, because there are sort of there are auction mechanics uh, in order to buy different power plants, and those have different uh, types. So you could buy a coal plant, or you could get some you know uh, wind turbines or whatever, and that sort of influences how much you have to to then advance your go and sort of aim for victory. Basically, I just yeah, it it is a very weighty game. That yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with with not getting along with heavier games like I would certainly consider myself someone who struggles with like really heavy games that have a lot of different mechanics and things you have to manage and keep your eye on um, so like I talked in the past about how Scythe is you know it is to me that is a heavy game mm. like that's something that you know, takes a lot of my concentration and I had to play it a few times to even kind of get a, a hold of what was going on. And I don't think it's a reflection on anyone if they just struggle or, or don't have fun playing those kind of games because, you know, we, we all have different levels of interest mm. and, like, yeah, nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest saying should we put this away and blend some kittens um while on the face of it that's a horrible thing to say uh i think it was the right call like if you put it away and you had fun doing something else for a bit great and you can come back to power grid like that's the nice thing about board games you can just keep coming back to them and and sort of chipping away at them until you really understand them like some of my most treasured games are ones that i really didn't get for the first four or five times i played them Mm. um and that's all right so sort of adjust your adjust your expectations going in like make sure you don't need the loo put some coffee on and (laughs) and you'll be you'll be enjoying building a a power infrastructure in not no time obviously a a handful of hours (laughs) so expurge all liquids and solids from your body Mm -hmm. check the that's how you you get true true you know concentration check the pipes for gunge yeah, you got to do that. Mm. Um, Lolis, do you want to take this n- this next one, which is from Sam, aka a orange 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 full, yeah, orange, yeah. orange full, who we met I- at Pax, which was a very nice it's experience. Really mm-hmm. oh. uh, she said, or they say, hello, team Dicebreaker. Two questions for a podcast. In one of the previous podcasts, Matt Jarvis made a comment in passing about preferring RPGs that are theater of the mind. I would love to know more about those kind of games, what titles you can recommend, and how you convince your friends to play them if they're used to D&D style fighting games. Should I do the next question, or should we um, start with that? Uh, one? Let's start with that, I guess. Okay. Hmm. I think, well, I mean, obviously I can't really speak for Matt Jarvis, but I think what he meant was, I, I don't, I kind of have a vague recollection of him saying this. I think it was more in terms of like, when you play D&D, you can either play it with like a map and minis, or you can play it just talking and trying to imagine where everything is, which is how we do it for Dungeon Breaker and just for videos in general. That's how we it's how we play RPGs. Uh, but I I also play with a different D and D group. Dean and I actually play D and D together, where the GM will have a map and he'll draw out approximately where everyone is, and we'll have minis that we move around to see how far away we are and if we can do things at a certain distance. Mm. So I think that's like. I think that can probably refer to a lot of RPGs. I mean, I'm sure there's certain ones where you might need the kind of map or, or whatever the bits are that you might need. But I think overall, it just depends on 
what you prefer yourself. So like, I know that I quite like either of those because theater of the mind is, is a lot more loose. It's a lot more like, you know, the GM can be like, okay, yeah, you're close enough and kind of almost cheat a little bit in that way. Whereas like, if you're on a map and you've got the minis, it's like, this is how far away I am. I know what I can do. So it can be a bit like for some people, it can be a bit nicer having that visual. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoy both, but I know some people have preferences for one or the other. Uh, yeah, I think I think I prefer using minis and a, and a map, but I think that definitely very much comes from a video game background of being able to visually see everything. Mm-hmm. And so not saying I don't have any imagination. I like to think I'm an imaginative fella myself, uh, but I also want to know exactly how far away I am from said beast so that I can take out my longbow and effectively shoot them or not shoot them, depending on how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> I am theatre of the mind all the way. Like, the this is the hill I will die on uh, and you know what everyone's <laughs> gonna have to imagine the hill because I ain't drawing it um, I do I will occasionally draw maps if people ask for them uh, or I'll occasionally ask for a map if if I do think it is really important that everyone knows exactly where they are if we're talking about like area of effect stuff or whatever um, but largely I find the times I've played with a map and it's been slowly revealed and the miniatures are all kind of there it I stop imagining things because I can see them I'm like eh, that's that's the objective and the objective is a tiny, like, unpainted, 3D printed gobbo. And it just, like, that's not, like... I think it's just because I, I I started playing Theatre of the Mind that I'm so, like... I just prefer it that way. It just feels a bit more vivid in my I noggin. Do, I think I agree in a way, yeah, that you can... You do kind of stop imagining a little bit. I think when we play Theatre of the Mind, I've got quite a vivid image of what's going on. Even if I might be wrong, maybe I misheard something, I still have something playing through my head whereas when it's on a map and it's in front of you while it's nice to have that like visual reference it does kind of take that bit away from you like I do just see like figures on a map at mm. the end of the day and yeah it's it's not as vivid I think my my imaginings yeah mm. should we have the other half imagination oh, sorry. imagination sorry. Land. <laughs> should we have the other half of uh, Sam's questions oh, yes uh, sorry uh, another comment from Alex Meehan in a podcast about playing an RPG over a whole weekend, and it got me wondering, what is the longest single game session you all have had? What were you playing, and how did you keep it fun for hours, or was it fun at all? Still enjoying all you do, stay safe. Sam, aka Orange of Fun. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think the longest game session I've had has been maybe six hours? I think. I, there might... There may be a longer one, but that's kind of the one that stands out for me. I've had like two different ones that have been about that time. One of them was a D&D session, which I didn't hugely enjoy because it was uh, like a pre-written scenario and it just dragged a little bit. Um, and another one was a game that should have only taken like three hours, but uh, we had one guy in particular who takes ages to take his turns. And so the game dragged on. And I enjoyed, like It didn't feel like six hours, so that one was fine. Um, but it was just like frustrating when I realised that six hours had passed and we could have played other games. Yeah, that's that's kind of annoying. Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah, I've so uh, essentially a lot of my previous experiences of playing RPGs have been one shot. Um, that's kind of where I started. I didn't really go straight into campaigns uh, and. There was a time where I created a dread campaign um, and we essentially met up um, with the express understanding that this was like it, like we were playing through the whole thing until we were done. Mm. Uh, and and this is a lesson I've learned. Um, don't start in the evening because <laughs> then by the time you're near the end people are really sleepy uh, and all that atmosphere you've built goes down the toilet <laughs> um, so also don't like eat a big takeaway meal before um, but yeah we I think we started at like 6 uh, and we didn't finish until four in the morning <gasps> oh uh, my. because essentially oh. uh, we had quite a few breaks in between that's like 10 hours uh, <laughs> we had quite a few breaks in between 
people were like messing about uh not like it, within the game so they were having a bit of a, a lot mm. of characters and like i just didn't anticipate how long people were going to take to work out stuff so like our dread campaigns are often built upon puzzle solving yeah things like that so again depending on the people you're playing with it might take them next to no time at all or it might take them three hours to work out what to do and you're just sat there going <laughs> i thought this wasn't that hard <laughs> but apparently it is uh, but we did the thing is uh they did finish it and it was quite an epic finish some people just fell asleep but like two <laughs> people kept going we just said they died and two, yeah two fair people enough kept going uh and because they were like no we want to finish this because it's really good and we did finish eventually at four in the morning wow yeah i've had longest rpg set yeah i've had dread games run until four in the morning as well yeah it happens because their their dread is designed to really be one shot i don't know how you play a dread camp yeah uh what about you dino uh i think my longest campaign uh, or game sesh was I mean to be fair now thinking about it only an hour less than millions it was like from 6 till 4 in the morning and it was when we first got introduced to D&D in uni it was like one of our uh, uni buddies was like well into D&D he was a big old GM and knew knew everything and we just like me and my housemates just finished watching the, the community episode of D&D we were like we really want to try this we really want to get into it so we, we messaged him and he came round with like a sack full of all his D books maps everything pens papers character sheets like a, an extra bag full of dices for everybody to use he, he was like kitted out he had that uh, bag ready to go for months I'm didn't he him, i imagine him looking like you know one of those musicians that have like the the harmonica oh like one man band bone. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like with D stuff <laughs> so like I mean, absolutely covered to, to paint a picture of him he's a he's a unique fella and i love him to bits he's he's like over six foot like six foot four or six foot six foot three uh and he wears shorts all year round um, all year round i have a canadian <laughs> friend who does that yeah <laughs> um the only time he never wore shorts uh, the only time he didn't wore shorts rather is when it was our graduation uh <laughs> ceremony and so he he actually wore a suit although i kind of really hoped he'd come in like like suit shorts, suit shorts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it didn't happen anyway <laughs> back to the D D thing yeah uh yeah he introduced us to D D. we all created our characters and i think the reason why our session went on for so long is because one of, one of my friends who's still my friend to this day and i love him to bits he's such a comedic fella and he wanted to base his character on warwick davies <laughs> uh so he based it around he was he was literally called warwick davies in the get campaign and he had a magical bassoon and it was he was he was the most hilarious individual ever and like we were trying to sneak into a magical camp. bassoon a magical bassoon that was his go-to weapon uh and that goddamn bassoon when we were trying to sneak into a, a camp it was like two guards spotted us one guard he said he's gonna play his magic bassoon to make them crap themselves uh did a good job <laughs> The guy crapped himself. The other guy, he completely missed. He got he got a one, and so the magic bassoon hit me instead oh, and killed no. me. Oh, <laughs> oh wow! It, I died, uh, but it was hilarious. PVP, yeah, um, unintentional PVP. Yeah, yeah, Hot yeah. Damn. And you know, in uni, you don't care about like oh. deadlines or anything, so you can stay up until stupid o'clock in the morning playing yeah. a D and D game. <laughs> yeah, as long as you've got enough snacks. Exactly. And there was yeah. like a co op around the corner from us, so you know, yeah, just, just pop get down to the snacks, oh, nice. get all the snacks, all the booze were sorted. Yeah, exactly. I think Stock <laughs> up, keep going. My longest RPG session was probably about 12 hours. Um, it was the Whoa. final session of the first ever campaign I joined. And we, we, we set out to play all day. So we met up, we started playing in the morning. We had like coffee, we had, you know, bacon rolls or whatever. Um, so we had breaks, so we sort of paused in the evening to eat something, but it was the end of the campaign, um, so it took ages, and we were all really sort of drawing it out, because we were super emotional about it, um, and then at the end, we got sucked through like a space portal, basically, into a Nexus world, and we had to choose which door to go through, which was a choice of three different games, 
So then we finished the game and we sat down and we were like, let's talk. And we started debating the merits of these three different games we've been offered. Um, I actually pulled a sickie from work the next day uh, because everyone else, like no, like everyone else was uh, self-employed. So like they all had the, the next day free and I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to work. So we met up the following afternoon and went to the pub and continued this big debate. Um, it was, it was incredible. Like the, the end of the campaign was brilliant, but the fact that we ended it and we weren't just like, okay, I'm tired and I'm a bit drunk. It was just like, no, we have to, we have to fix our destiny now. Uh, yeah, it was a, a bloody delight. Um, I think the only time I've played a game for longer in one continuous session is like, I've had 14 hour games of Twilight Imperium and those are less fun <laughs> because those are highly competitive strategic things. Um, they're still exhilarating, but 14 hours of staring at some hexes with some plastic oh. ships on it and just frowning takes its toll, I would say. It hurts just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll take the next one, and then, Dean, you can follow up with the, the final question. This is from Daniel uh, Hallinan. hope I said that right. As most of you are GMs, when playing as a PC in another GM's game, have you ever struggled when a GM's approach to running their game conflicts with your own preferences? Not talking about backseat GMing, just more enjoying it as a player. Come on, let's oh get salty. Gosh, yeah. Let's talk about the, all those times GMs have failed us. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like, it, to be honest, most of the time it's D&D stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually just because I don't really enjoy D&D that much. Um, so it's, a lot of the time the system isn't helping, but I, like, I've left D&D campaigns before, partly because I'm, I just can't find the time but also because like when entire sessions revolve around going through a dungeon like like literal three hour sessions going through a single dungeon room by room and just like oh look there's a pot in it oh look it's a monster and like especially when I play characters that are often aren't combat focused mm. I just sit there and I'm just oh, I'm so bored. Like, uh, or when like they they aren't willing to play along for laughs. Mm. So like when you know I want to, you know, like I offer to do something that's not going to make me overpowered. It's not like I want to do this and you're not letting me. It's mostly like, hey, how about we do this? This should be fun. And they're like, mm, no, it doesn't really fit with what's going on. Mm. And I'm like. Mm. Let me have some fun. I think you and I are quite similar in that we really prefer story forward campaigns and characters. Yeah. Um, I just not. It's why, like, my answer to that question, the first one would have been, like, yeah, mind theatre for sure. Mm. Like, I just don't. I'm not very gripped by uh, a grid, you know, pap paper grid and just, like, minis on it. Uh, I'd need something that's going to get my attention. Mm. I think for me, like I've had a few times where I've just had a, a real clash with sort of a session and a group, but it's more to do with the kind of the player culture and the GM allowing stuff that I would crack down on. Like when people met a game a lot, it really bothers me. Like because I, it's we're it's role playing. You don't want to stop and have somebody be like, okay, who's got the highest uh, charisma? We should send yeah. someone into chat. Do you have what's your charisma mod? Uh, like it defeats the whole purpose for me and it it's it's really annoying um so it's yeah it's that kind of thing or like i've I've played in a couple of sessions so i've just been like i'm not having fun because people are like it's one thing to to like take to to make jokes and take the piss during a session that's fine but when characters are doing it like in a very matter way it's just like it's like you're not you're just taking the piss out of the whole experience now it's like that bothers me as well so yeah, uh, basically, it's more that it's not. I don't. I've never had a problem with a GM really, apart from you know like being bored on a dungeon crawl. It's more when they've not cracked down on other players being little bastards around the table. I think is the way I'd describe it. Whoa! I know. I tried not to drop any any expletives <laughs> there, and I was like, no, that's uh, it's that's the only it's word for go. them. So, Dino. Yeah, like, um, 
I can't really say much in response to the to the GM thing because I'm not a GM, so I I have very little experience in, in that side of thing. Um, I I kind of just like I play the game, I let the GM do its thing, and I trust them wholeheartedly. I would never imagine just interrupting them and be like, hey, maybe maybe you should do this thing instead because I mean. I don't know. He actually, he's he's a GM. He knows what he's doing. Clearly, he's GMing for a reason. <laughs> There's a reason I'm a player and he's a GM. So I'm going to keep in my lane. <laughs> oh, oh no! Break out of your lane. So well behaved. Oh. <laughs> Give him a headache. Is what they're there for? Uh, lonely. I'm not a GM, but I've been I've been watching intently and trying to like pick up things that I like that certain GMs do and like kind of make mental notes of things that I don't like they do so like don't like that they do <laughs> um so that like when it comes to me GMing at some point that I'll be like wanting to avoid certain things I think uh one thing that like stands out for me would be um and this hasn't happened a huge amount but um it frustrates frustrates me when it does. It's like when another player kind of takes over, and like it's it's um, and it, I feel like it's the GM's place to kind of make sure that does that doesn't happen too much. Because at the end of the day, like you don't want to start fighting with each other. I think it's like the GM needs to, in my head anyway, needs to like make sure that everyone kind of gets time to do what they want to do and like it's mm. time to like f- for their character to say or do or you know make sure that they finish before somebody else steps in and stuff but that's like something that kind of stands out for me as something that i've noted for my future gming uh but yeah. otherwise i'm not a gm yet so i can't can't really speak in that you same are way. you <laughs> are you just don't know it yet <laughs> Yeah, there's a GM inside you, Lonely. There is. It's trying to get out. Dying to come out, but it's also very nervous and shy. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Dino, bring us home. We got one question left. One question from Philip. Philip. (laughs) Philip Clem Ow or Clem Ow uh, at Clem Two K Three. What about your thoughts on tabletop simulator? What about your thoughts on tabletop simulator and suggestions for games to play on it? Would be really useful to hear about in these troubled times. Dot, dot, dot. Cosmic Frog. Um, <laughs> Just play Cosmic Frog. It's great. I can't wait for it to come out in a physical edition. Cosmic Frog. <laughs> I play a lot of um, Quacks, or I used to play a lot of Quacks on there when I couldn't physically play it. So, Quacks of Quedlinburg. It was mentioned uh, yeah. on last week's podcast, in fact. Ooh. Oh, okay. I've mentioned <laughs> it a few times as well. Because I've been playing the real life version since I now have a house. Raising my eyebrows at Johnny because I know what he's talking about. Um, I, but I think um, tabletop simulator is great though. It's a good way of playing some games. Uh, there is a sort of I find it a bit fiddly and there is a bit of a disconnect. It's like it just reminds me that I'm not actually picking up pieces and moving things around and sitting at a table with my friends, but it gets you pretty damn close. Uh, I think it's tremendous. Mm. So, and you gotta, you uh, gotta. I think remember as well that games take longer on tabletop sim. So a game yeah. that might take you half an hour in real life is gonna take longer. Not just because it's harder to move stuff, but also because people will mess around a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, <laughs> do you know what, what kind of games do you like to play on tabletop simulator? I, I haven't picked it up in a in a long while, but mm. I, th- I think genuinely, like Lodi's was saying, like Quacks was pro- like the most recent one I did. I played quite a bit of it with uh, with Lodi's because Lodi's introduced me to it. Lodi's introduces me to a bunch of games, basically. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we played Quack quite a bit, and I, I quite when, when the whole lockdown thing happened, uh, and it's still ongoing, and we still can't really go visit one another properly yet. But Tabletop Simulator is as close as close can be to being able to still play board games, mm. uh, and I really thoroughly enjoyed that. Like I like Johnny said, it's not the same as being able to pick up pieces physically or anything but it's so damn close it's so it's so fun i'm thinking whack on a vr headset even better <gasps> like just put yourself right there Whoa, yeah haptic gloves are oh, and then and then and then you can feel like you're picking up the pieces i i don't worry i'll put <gasps> put it together yes it'll, it'll please this sounds amazing <laughs> i want to do this so when someone inevitably enlarges enlarges a manticore you can like really get a good look. Yeah, uh, you can see it. You, you just can ride really it. See it in your peripheral. Yeah, vision. go and ride on the manticore. And getting its enormous mouth. 
<laughs> not that I've ever um, enlarged a manticore on the table. What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely preposterous. Uh, I've mostly played games that I'm familiar with on TTS because uh, sometimes they don't come with rule books, and like learning a new game entirely uh, using TTS can be a lot. Mm. Um, I've discovered that there's a huge amount of people putting a lot of work into that community. Um, obviously, there are paid uh, games that you can you can buy, um, but there's a lot of of fan-made mods. Um, some of them are just amazing. Like I think I've talked about the Clank one I played before, mm. which was just like, who, what in God's name, and who created this? And they're amazing because we managed to play that game with someone who kind of knew the rules, but like wasn't a hundred percent on it. But like because of the scripting was so good that we basically didn't really need to worry about that. Um, so kudos to the people putting in the good work um, but I think it you know it could be an opportunity for people to play games that they've never tried before mm. um, and then when all this stuff is over uh, go out and buy a physical copy which I thoroughly intend yeah. to do with Clank in Space I did that uh, so, with uh, Rallyman GT after playing on TTS yeah, nice. yeah I really think that again this is my view, it's not the view of, of Dicebreaker. Um, I think that TTS is a great thing in terms of mods because I really do believe that uh, the tabletop community is the kind to genuinely go out and buy physical copies of these games. Mm. I have once done they've as well. Tried them. Yeah. yeah, I just think it's because it's not the same, and also, you know, having the thing physically there is in your collection is like special mm. so like i'm you know i bought the digital copy of scythe but i'm going to buy a physical copy as well simply because i love that game so much i want to be able to have the full experience mm -hmm. and like the physical version is the full experience like when we played blood rage that other week <laughs> like number one <laughs> that game is broken um number two uh, like we kind of i i kind of had an idea of how to play but like i still think being able to play the physical copy would i would have been a lot more like okay i kind of get what you know i get what's going mm. on so mm. uh, yeah. tts well there there is a video made by wheels on the youtube channel yes. for tips on tabletop simulator uh youtube.com forward slash dicebreaker and there's also TTS coverage on the site, right, man? Is there something on games you can yeah, play? Yeah, um, we often so we have a list of the top ten mods, so that's not official games. Mm -hmm. um, although they have put out some official mods, um, we've covered various uh, news regarding TTS. Mm. So, uh, like the Undaunted North Africa demo, oh yeah, of course, put out uh, on TTS, mm. which I still need to play. Uh, and also that we regularly cover deals relating to TTS, so it's it often goes on sale. Nice. So. Um, and also, dicebreaker.com is a brilliant resource for learning about all sorts of board games that you could then check for yourself to see if they're on Tabletop Simulator. That's dicebreaker.com. Dot com. Uh, and with that, I think that probably about does it for episode thirteen of the Dicebreaker podcast. Uh, I would like well, to. Well, we made it through. I know. Um, <laughs> Dean didn't pretend his internet went happened. down, and he didn't sort of just decide to to make himself scarce. So thank you again for sticking with us the whole way, Dean, and for yeah. for. Uh, bringing your lovely effervescent energy to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for ha having me. Uh, I am on fire right now, so I am very excited to open my window once again. Yes. Thank you for having me. It warm. <laughs> so we'll we'll do this last bit uh, very, very quickly. Um, yet, uh, so don't forget, www.dicebreaker.com is a website. You can go to it, youtube.com forward slash dicebreaker. That's a YouTube channel. You can also visit that. And if you want some Dicebreaker merch, uh, we've got four t-shirt designs available right now. Um, if you go to dicebreaker.myshopify.com, you That's can... That's my Shopify. You can, uh, you can cover yourself with such amazing slogans as Wood for Sheep, question mark, and Big Deck Energy, uh, which yeah. never really gets old. So, um, yeah, thank... Um, oh, carry on. 
when is when is the next episode of Dungeon Breaker coming out? Oh yeah, uh, tomorrow. Featuring if, Feet Dean Abdu. Feet Dean Abdu. Uh, if you are listening to or watching this on uh, Friday the 26th of June in the year of our Lord 2020, it will be out tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, if you're watching Tomorrow. it later than that, it's already up, mate. So go go treat yourself. Um, Join us in the chat. Come see yes. uh, what makes Fareed such a handsome, cool guy as they oh. go visit some red caps. And that'll probably work out fine. Uh, so, yeah, thanks uh, to Lolies and Mian for, for being on the podcast and being great as ever. Aww, thanks for having me. Too- you're too kind oh, stop it uh, I'm Johnny Chiodini I have also been here we will catch you uh, very soon uh, so yeah thank you very much for listening and or watching and have a lovely day bye bye, bye.